Okay, so let's put it in the. So shall I do that? Shall I switch? Okay, so. One, two, one, one, two. I might put it slightly further up. Yeah. One, two, three, four. I'm happy, I've... Oh. Okay, up, no, it's this one.
morning, everybody. I think I'm switched on. Am I? Can you hear me? <laughs> Just wait a minute for people to sit down. It's lovely to see you all here on this lovely sunny morning. I think perhaps spring has come at last. And haven't we waited a long time? We've got a lot to get through this morning, so I'm going to go straight down to business. First of all, I'm making a plea for help, yet again. We really need more people to get involved in setting up our monthly meetings, both with the technical side and the carrying about of tables and equipment. For the tech setup, we have a great team of Jim and Belinda, assisted by Nick and Tony, who set up the live screening and the projector screen. But if somebody can't make it, we're very stretched. And if two can't make it at the same month, we really start to panic. With the new church equipment hopefully being here in time for our June meeting, it would be great to have a couple more people willing to learn how the system works and to be able to help out. I know nothing about technical matters, but I know there are people out there who do. So if you have any techie knowledge or interest, please will you help? You could talk to me or to Nick or to Jim in the break or contact us via the website. And secondly, we need help to set up the church, bring down tables from the store cupboard, help carry the heavy flask to the re refreshment table. All you need to do is turn up half an hour or so earlier and flex your muscles. And I'm told if you can lift a pint, you can do the job. So there must be plenty of people out there with the requisite qualifications. Again, please come and talk to us. We're also losing some of our refreshments team in July, so we need more volunteers for that, and we need more help with taking cash payments with, for trips with the card machine. It's not fair to keep depending on the same few people, so there's a whole host of jobs there. Please think which of them you might be able to help with. Right, that's the whinging over for this month. <laughs> The conveners meeting took place last week and was very well attended. Thank you to all who took part and particularly to Linda for organising it. There were a number of comments and suggestions that we'll be discussing at our next committee meeting and we'll feed back after that. New name labels were issued for conveners so if you weren't able to attend and are here today you can collect one from Linda at the group's table during the break. We've been con contacted by a local netball coach who's offered to run a taster session for walking netball, if there's sufficient interest. There are a number of U3A members currently playing walking football, so what can be done in football can also be done in netball, apparently. After a similar taster session for Aston Clinton U3A, 25 people signed up to play regularly. So there's a challenge to us. If you'd like to know more, again, see Linda at the group's table during the break. We've been asked to say a word about the Ballinger Arts Society, which, to which a number of our members already belong. They're a small, friendly society who meet on the last Thursday evening of the month with lectures involving all aspects of art, decorative art and music. There's a poster and flyers with more information, again on the group's table. It's going to be very busy round there at break. Um, and if you're seriously interested, I have a couple of tickets to attend as a guest for free. It's usually £10. We want to make sure that our members are aware of the new UK Emergency Alert Service. I don't know how many are. 
I only found out about it very recently. It's a UK government service which allows the government and the emergency services to send urgent messages warning the public if there's a life-threatening situation nearby. They'll do this by sending a siren-like alert to smartphones. The reason I'm raising it today is that on the 20th, you don't have to, you don't sign up to be alerted, they automatically contact your phone. And on the 23rd of April, there's to be a national test of the service, which is expected to take place in the early evening. At this stage, only smartphone users will be contacted. But if this is you, you'll be sent an alert that'll ring for about 10 seconds. I'm only giving you a very brief outline, but Martin Whitfred has very kindly put together a useful sheet of information about this, which we're going to attach to our next chairman's letter, so you've got the full details there. Uh, but in the meantime, again on the group's table, there's a copy of that sheet which has the, web, the website address at the bottom. It's a government website where you can look up and get more information about this. And now, if, anybody, if you'd like to make any group announcements, could you queue up as usual? But first of all, we'd like to welcome, uh, I've just written Jane Larkham, Jane Larkham and Dick Byford, who I'm sure many of you will certainly know Jane from her work with Wendover News. And Jane and Dick would like to say a few words about the upcoming changes to the newspaper, so thank you. And then uh, afterwards, any of our members who wish to make announcements, please line up. Well, thank you very much. I did bring with me a few copies of the April edition, so if you haven't seen one yet, please come and see me at break and I, I can give you one. Um, I've only got a few minutes, so I'm going to speak more quickly than Judy did. Um, so I'm, just, I, I'm going to give you a short history of Wendover News because if you've been reading Wendover News um, this year, on the front page has been information about how it's going to be changing. So I've just, this is an opportunity for me to tell you a little bit more about that. So um, just I'm going to give a bit of history and Dick or Richard um, is going to give um, a, a, some news about the future. So the first edition was in September 1989 and I've been involved in editing it since then. So if you want to know anything about the history, just come and ask me. Um, and the intention of it was to let local people know what's happening locally, to allow local businesses to recruit new customers, and to enable local organizations, such as this one, to reach out to local people and enable better social contact. What has happened in the 30 plus years since then? Well, electronic communication has meant that in individuals have been able to interact very efficiently, as we know. But local news media lost revenue from advertisers in the classified property and car markets in particular, and therefore local news has suffered terribly. Um, and in particular, the, the thing which has changed most is that we actually now have no coverage of council activity in local newspapers, in the general local newspapers. Although Wendover News, as you know, does have um, a section from the parish council. So we do have some at local level, but not at the other levels of government, local government. Now, this work has traditionally been done by four part-timers in the business. So they were responsible for editorial, advertising, graphics, and bookkeeping and other administrative tasks. And the deliveries, most importantly, have been done by volunteers by popular demand. If you want to know what that means, I can tell you later. So, Wendover News has continued with its initial aims, but has now identified the possibility of including volunteers to increase online coverage, as well as giving more specific geographic coverage. And this offers opportunity for people with the skills to sh with skills to share them and for others of all ages to learn new skills. So if you are interested in getting involved in Wendover News, please do come and talk to us. And this will all be done through a new legal entity which will be 
went over CIC, which is a community interest company, a bit like a charity, but a business. Um, and Richard is leading this transition, so I'm going to hand over to him now. Three years ago, I accidentally retired. Um, I got some money from the government once a month, and I was told to stay at home, as most people were. So I thought, well, this is okay. I've got a, a room full of guitars that need playing, and I've got a, a garden full of bonsai that need talking to and occasional hugs. So I thought, well, is it, this is what retirement's all about. So I'll, I'll, I'll just go with the flow and uh, settle down. Um, so I joined the bonsai club and uh, formed a rock and roll band, as you do when you're 68 and thought, well, this is, this is my life from now on. But there was something at the back of my mind that said that after uh, a 45-year career doing consultancy and stuff like that, uh, quite an adventurous career, uh, that's all sort of going to waste. So I decided at the age of 68 to restart a business, and my first client uh, became Jane, because she... Uh, quite rightly deserved to step back after 33 years and had the aspiration for putting Wendover News into the community, owned by the community, gifting it to the community and didn't quite know how to go about that. So I said, well, I'll help. I don't live in Wendover now, by the way, so I'm just in here to help the thing get started. So between us, we managed to use Wendover News to... Uh, get a, 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 to attract the first few volunteers. And we've got some wonderful people. We've got a team of about nine people, uh, some who have extensive experience in business and in publishing and uh, in accounting and that sort of thing. We've also got an operational team who are at least capable of turning out um, this publication and maintaining the online presence. But the vision is a lot wider and that is to eventually refine this to be more focused towards the people who actually value it and read it uh, and make sure they get the content they look for and to do much more with the online. And when I say much more with the online, there's actually a lot of competition online and the competition is uh, quite low quality and sometimes quite dangerous. So what we're putting in place is editorial uh, policies of practice that control uh, the quality of the output online so that when you read it you can trust it and you know it's not fake news, it's not conspiracy theory. So we, we, we do it to defend the community of Wendover and surrounding, surrounding villages. So that will take some effort. We've got the right people in place but probably not enough of them. So this is the ideal environment to talk to people and say have you got that niggling feeling that a lot of the stuff you've done in your career is still useful and you might be able to give a day or an hour a week or something uh, to be a mentor, coach to some of the other people? They're all ages. Two of our top volunteers are in their mid-twenties and they're going to be driving the whole thing. So there's, there's your experience that can feed into... Uh, coaching, mentoring younger people, but there's also uh, the opportunity, if you desire, uh, to be coached and mentored by 25-year-olds in things that are new to you. The world's changing. Uh, it will give you an opportunity to come in and do valuable work because it's a workplace, but also to get the benefit of associating with a much wider range of people than you might otherwise meet. So in the next few months you'll see, uh, see this changing very slightly because their first aim is to replicate this one, what's gone before but also to uh, improve the, uh, the, the, the content to include a, a, a better uh, demographic. Uh, in there there'll be adverts for volunteers and you can sign up as a volunteer in either of those roles, either as a learner or a teacher, mentor, coach, or a combination of both on your terms. So I hope, hope people will take that offer up and, and, uh, and join in. 
uh, it should be very rewarding. We aim to make it rewarding. So let's just finish by asking an odd question. Um, was there anyone at Amersham Hospital yesterday who dropped one of these, the U3A badge? <laughs> no, I was really hoping that someone put their hand up. That's me. I lost my badge yesterday. Um, because it's a small world. Uh, and we'd like to make the, uh, the world of Wendover uh, uh, no smaller, but seem perhaps a little smaller because you know more people in it. And you know more people in it, so it becomes more friendly and a lot more interesting. Uh, and being part of this organisation is one way you can do it. And I would like to think that in the future, Wendover News will be the other way of doing that. So thank you very much. Thank you. We'll certainly be looking with interest at how things develop. I think uh, Veronica, sorry, scooting round. I think you're. Good morning, everyone. Veronica Lockett, Travel Team. Um, we had a wonderful day in Gloucester yesterday. The weather was superb. Um, and we had a free day to do whatever we liked and it certainly worked out well. So thank you to Marion Elwood who unfortunately was unable to come and do it and to run it but thank you to her for organising it. And we've got two new visits to announce. Now the travel team um, are trying to work it so that we don't have too many expensive trips because as you know the coaches are costing a, a lot of money roughly £700 to hire a coach at the moment, and that's quite a lot of money. So the first visit is on Thursday the 22nd of June, which is the fourth Thursday of June, and it's a visit to Stockwood Discovery Centre in Luton, so about a 40-minute drive, and it'll be by own transport. Um, entry to the centre is free, so it's a completely <coughs> free outing except for paying your driver something. Uh, Stockwood Discovery Centre is a museum and gardens in, located in the stables and gardens that once belonged to Stockwood House, which no longer exists. The gardens feature a selection of themed um, gardens. The stable block contains the Discovery Hall galleries with the, muse with the Mossman collection of horse-drawn vehicles and carriages. There's a cafe on site for refreshments and the approximate length of the visit is two hours plus time for the gardens. Uh, details are on the travel <laughs> team board and please see me to book that one. And then on Thursday the 20th of July, uh, Christine is organising a visit to Strawberry Hill House and York House Gardens, which are both in Twickenham. Uh, it's limited to 34 people, so we're having a smaller coach than the usual 53-seater and the cost is £38.50 and that is because we're having a private guided tour around the house. It's not usually open on a Thursday but we're having a special guided tour for that one. Uh, Strawberry Hill House is a beautiful example of Gothic revival architecture. The gardens are flat and there are three floors to the house with a lift to the first floor. Uh, in the afternoon a free flow visit to York House Gardens, which date back to the 17th century and form part of the present-day civic offices. Many features of the grounds remain from Indian industrialists, so Rattan Tata's previous ownership. Again, all the details are on the travel team board, and please see Christine to book that one. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Veronica. Right, and now Roy would like to say, well, do a short presentation about the community bus. I said we were busy this morning. <laughs> My assistant is ready. How are you doing? Right, good morning. Roy Coates from the Wendover Community Car. We've just produced this piece of paper to tell you that we can take you out and about. Um, a lot of you know the community car, but we have suffered in the last three years. The pandemic came and I parked the car up. It never moved for a year. 
when I moved here, I had to go and get four new tyres because the others were perished. But anyway, we are back. And here's a lovely picture outside Budgeons. I want to tell you a little bit more about the car. It was started over 25 years ago by a group of people who saw there was a need for people to be able to get out and about. And people with special needs, like our lovely lady here who I take out every Friday morning. Without the community car, that lady wouldn't be able to get out because she needs the rear lift. She can't get in a car, she can't get in a taxi. So the only way she can get out is with a vehicle like that. Her aim today is the same as it's been for the last 25 years, to help the community. We do different things now. Like the other Sunday, I was manning the phone. A lady rang me up and said, could you take my mother to Watford Hospital tomorrow. So I thought, can we do it? So I made a few phone calls and I found a driver who would do it. And we took her to the hospital. She went in, she had an assessment for a cataract operation. It took two hours, we waited for her. The following week, she had her operation done. Um, so that is the sort of things we do. But um, we never used to do hospital visits and things like that because we were busy enough with what we were doing but we never really recovered um, since the pandemic so we've had to go further afield now uh, to do these other things and I won't go on too long but I'd just like to thank some of our supporters Wendover News has always supported us anytime I've asked them for help with an advertisement etc they've always done it Wendover Parish Council have also supported us this year. Without them, we probably couldn't continue. And last but not least, the local solicitor, Stuart Fantham, has once again supported us. Thank you for listening to me. We hope to see you out and about. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Right, coffee time now. We've had to wait a while this morning. It's coming up towards 25 past, so quarter to 10 to, listen for the bell, but certainly be back in our seats by 10 to to listen to our speaker. Thank you.
maybe someone. Did they turn that on? It's on now, yeah. Oh, right, oh, they must have turned it.
And I, oh, you can, that's. So that one is off. Right, are you off there? Yeah, that's off. Right, it is. Okay. That's better. I'll start again. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and also for the, for the very warm welcome that I have received. Now, all of my... Uh, presentations, they, they come from the murky and ever intriguing world of uh, real life international espionage. And this tale was uh, born uh, in the struggle between the competing ideologies of Western capitalism and Eastern European communism that raged from the end of the Second World War uh, until the demise of the collapse of the Soviet Union in the early 90s. Uh, in the so-called Cold War, countless people lost their lives fighting for the idea of free speech and self-determination. And today I would like to uh, recount to you the life and death of one such individual um, who was uh, slain at the hands of his own country's government here in Britain some 45 years ago. Wow. Um, now, hopefully, if both of my clickers work, I'm double clicking today, we'll begin. Just a, a little bit about me. Uh, I spent 34 years in the police service in London, always um, in, in the London area with many different roles and responsibilities, sometimes in uniform, sometimes in plain clothes. But the last 12 years I spent in the world of um, police intelligence, where my focus became the world of organised criminal networks and crimes of violence. With five and a half years to go, I acquired a national role in counter-terrorism within the Metropolitan Police Counter-Terrorism Command, SO15. And although discretion and the Official Secrets Act mean that work must go largely undisclosed, it was here that I gained a large interest and perhaps a small uh, appreciation of the work of our secret uh, security and intelligence services. Now, uh, when I retired uh, in January 2019, my colleagues, they arranged a, a few goodbye treats for me, if you like. Um, they included lunch at the a new American embassy down at Battersea to say goodbye to some friends and colleagues that I'd worked with there um, for a number of years. My wife and I were also very lucky to be given a, a, a tour of the home of the then Prime Minister Theresa May at number 10 Downing Street. And I am pleased to report there were no parties taking, <laughs> taking place uh, at that time. Now, uh, they also arranged a visit to the, uh, the Metropolitan Police Crime Museum at the new New Scotland Yard down at the Thames Embankment. I had visited the so-called Black Museum uh, over 30 years before uh, when it was housed at the, um, at the new Scotland Yard at St James Park. Amongst the museum's amazing exhibits that included handwritten notes from the uh, Jack the Ripper inquiry, the gas oven and uh, a boiling pot used by uh, Dennis Nilsson to boil many of his victims' body parts. Uh, there was one item uh, amongst all of these that for me stood out above all others. Um, it was, uh, it measured uh, about the same as a ballpoint pen tip and it was housed behind a giant magnifying glass. Uh, this ma tiny metallic object was the stuff of legend. A legacy of the distrust and the misunderstanding between East and West during the Cold War and a highly significant piece of espionage folklore. 
I am, of course, referring to that microscopic pellet that was used to murder the Bulgarian journalist Georgi Markov. Here, on the streets, on London's Waterloo Bridge, in September 1978. It brought back memories from the first time that I'd laid eyes on it, over 30 years before, and now after what seemed like an ocean of time, I found I was still captivated, not only by what it was, but also by what it represented. So, today I would like to uh, share with you uh, the events leading up to Mr Markov's murder uh, and the reasons why this talented and gregarious author and playwright was slain uh, here uh, on the streets of, of Britain. This is the story of Georgi Markov and the poison umbrella murder. Now you get a lot for your money in this uh, um, talk. You, you get a lot of things, including time travel. Because I need to take you back. I need to take you back to the decade that fashion forgot. Yes, it was the 1970s. <laughs> and uh, specifically, 1978. Louise Brown from Oldham in Lancashire became the world's very first test tube baby in a procedure that we now know as IVF treatment. Danny Zuko and Sandy Olsen danced their way into cinematic history in the musical Greece. Can you believe it was that long ago? And the world had no idea what Kate Bush was singing about. <laughs> when Wuthering Heights made it to number one in March of that year. 1978 was also the year that a 49-year-old Bulgarian male by the name of Georgi Markov was working as a political commentator at Bush House uh, on the Aldwych um, in London in the Eastern European section of the BBC World Service. Each day, Markov would leave his British wife, Annabelle, and their small child, Alexandra, to drive from his smart terraced home in Lynette Avenue, Clapham, um, in his little green Simca van, um, to uh, London's South Bank. Um, he would, drive, uh, he would uh, park his, his van next to the National Theatre. Can you remember when parking in London was <laughs> quite so easy? Now, um, he felt an affinity with the National Theatre. He'd been a celebrated author and playwright back uh, in Bulgaria uh, before events there had seen him become an enemy of his own country's government some nine years before. He longed to be known for his literary works in the West, uh, but for now it was his job at the BBC that paid the bills and also gave him a voice with which to criticise the regime back home in Bulgaria. Each day, he would climb the, that hideous uh, and iconic stairwell leading from the National Theatre up onto Waterloo Bridge, uh, where he would usually then walk the three quarters of a mile or so uh, to his office at, at Bush House. On the 7th of September, 1978, Markov parked his van and he began his walk. He climbed that staircase leading onto Waterloo Bridge. Uh, turning left, he continued walking across the bridge uh, and until he came uh, level with that bus stop that you can see in the photograph. It was then that he felt a very sharp stinging sensation in the rear of his upper right thigh. He, he turned and he saw a man behind him and an umbrella on the ground. Uh, this unknown person uh, picked up the umbrella and mumbled an apology uh, to Markov. Now, Markov watched as the man crossed Waterloo Bridge onto the other side and he got into a, a, a black taxi that was stationary on the other side. The taxi then drove off in the direction towards South London. Now I did wait all of 15 minutes on Waterloo Bridge to try and find a 1978 black taxi, but without success. So here is a black and white taxi 
uh, sorry, is a, is a, tax, a modern taxi in black and white to represent that scene. However, the point is, the whole incident was over in less time than it has just taken me to tell you that. And in just four days, Georgi Markov would be dead. To try and understand the meaning behind his death, we have to take a look at his life. He was born in 1929 in pre-communist Sofia in Bulgaria, uh, to a very middle-class family. After a, a Soviet-style education, he then entered university to study um, uh, industrial chemistry. While he was at university, he contracted tuberculosis, and this confined him to long periods of rest and isolation. To allay the boredom, he felt, he began, in, he began penning short stories um, and, and, and little novelettes, as they were called by him. He discovered that he had a talent for writing. He left university to concentrate on writing pieces that raised his profile in Bulgarian literary circles. He received a lot of acclaim from the Union of Bulgarian Writers. And within a couple of years, his books were being turned into plays for the Bulgarian populace. He came to the attention of the Bulgarian regime, and in particular, um, its leader, the very autocratic uh, leader of Bulgaria, a man by the name of Todor Shivkov. Now, Shivkov was a very cold, cunning politician who had risen through the ranks of the People's Party after the communist coup in Bulgaria in 1944. Uh, he was seen as a hardliner even by his Kremlin masters. And Bulgarian historians, they view Shivkov as, a, as a, an uninspiring leader who was also responsible for many of the hardships of, of ordinary Bulgarian society. He was given to making quite outlandish, extraordinary quotes. And he liked to surround himself with um, people from the creative uh, fields in Bulgaria, the arts and sciences. He saw the value of aligning himself to Markov. And he promoted Markov's books and plays uh, as being an example of being a good Bulgarian uh, citizen. But as Markov became familiar uh, with the trappings and the privileges for the uh, ruling elite, he saw through that facade of equality through communism. And he began to publicly criticise the system. His fictional books and plays began to mirror the daily struggle of ordinary Bulgarians who were battling against a very um, corrupt and disdainful government. But to the egotistic Shivkov, this uh, criticism, it, it amounted to an act of treason by Markov. And he very unceremoniously cut all ties and all promotion of promoting of Markov's works and books. In 1969, with his uh, relationship with the government, and in particular Shivkov failing badly, Markov went to see his brother in Bologna, in Italy. He always intended to return back to Bulgaria, but whilst he was there, his travel visa, a symbol of his elevated um, uh, position in, in Bulgarian society, was revoked. And Markov realised that if ever he travelled back to Bulgaria, he would probably never be allowed to leave the country again. So in 1971, instead of returning home, he decided to come to Britain as a political refugee. Now this photograph was taken by his brother at Bologna railway station as he prepared to make that long trip to, to Britain. In Bulgaria, Shivkov's revenge was to remove all trace of Markov's uh, literary works from every bookshop, library, theatre, and university. Um, and and he, he wanted to erase him from history. 
Markov was charged in absentia with um, defection to the West, and he was sentenced to six and a half years uh, hard labour uh, in prison. But of course he wasn't there to serve it. Markov, uh, he was uh, granted asylum uh, to uh, live and work in Britain. And here he got a job with the BBC. Uh, first of all, as a translator, but then as a commentator on Bulgarian politics within the Eastern European section of the World Service. He used that position to broadcast criticism of the pro-Russian government, and in particular, Comrade Shivkov. Now, he also worked with um, Radio Free Europe, uh, which was um, a, an American-backed radio service dedicated to pro-Western propaganda uh, across the, a host of Eastern Bloc countries. Now, Markov and his fellow dissidents, they would discuss uh, the possibility that by their criticism here, that their lives uh, were in danger somehow. But Markov, he dismissed that. He said that in Britain, no one would try to harm him here. And so we, we turn uh, back to that strange incident on Waterloo Bridge in September of 1978. Uh, Markov made his way to work. He was aware of this continuing stinging sensation in his leg. He mentioned it to his fellow journalists, including a fellow Bulgarian called Theo Lurkov, and he told him the story about this a man with the umbrella and getting into a taxi. He tried to get on with his day. By the end of his shift at the BBC, he was feeling dreadful, and he went home to his family. However, uh, later that night, uh, his wife, realising that there was something really badly wrong with him, she called an ambulance. And Markov was uh, taken to uh, St James Hospital in Ballam. Now the medical team at St James's Hospital were initially very uh, sceptical of this uh, irritated and feverish Markov as he spoke of being poisoned by the KGB. Um, but there was a, a Dr Bernard Riley who uh, was part of the medical services there. And he believed what he was being told by Markov. He essentially believed that Markov had been uh, uh, poisoned. But unfortunately, Dr. Riley and the medical team, they were uh, unable to affect his condition. And four days later, on the 11th of September, 1978, at the age of 49, Georgi Markov had a massive heart attack and passed away. Now because he had uh, alluded uh, to being the victim of a KGB death plot, the Metropolitan Police ordered a post-mortem uh, be performed on his body. A Dr Rufus Crompton performed the autopsy, um, noting the red mark on, Marcos, on the back of Marcos' leg. He cut a tissue sample from the area with a matching sample from the other leg. And from that um, uh, sample, one of that sample on his rear upper right thigh, he removed a tiny metallic object from the site of the inflamed tissue. I do have to say, I've done this talk many times, and at one of those talks to a, a, another U3A, I was approached by a lady who told me a slightly amusing tale because she had been a, a professor, as he was, Professor Rufus Crompton's medical secretary at the time of the post-mortem on Georgi Markov. And she was able to put some detail around that uh, autopsy. And she told me that when um, Rufus Crompton removed with a tiny pair of tweezers the pellet from Marcos's leg, he promptly dropped it onto the floor and it was there amongst the blood and detritus, shall we say. And there was an amusing tale of him, uh, the medical secretary, and an investigating police officer scrabbling around on the floor 
trying to find this tiny pellet. Um, and it still makes me laugh when I talk about it. Now the pellet, it measured <clears throat> 1.7 millimetres in diameter and it was composed of 90% platinum and 10% iridium. It had two tiny holes drilled through it, forming an X-shaped cavity. It was taken to uh, Port and Down, the Chemical Biological Weapons Research Establishment. And there, the experts, they could not detect the presence of any poison whatsoever. As a qualified toolmaker before I entered the police service, uh, and aside from its lethal intent, I think it is a beautifully constructed capsule uh, capable of taxing the abilities of the most skilled engineers of the time. Now, in an age before uh, Twitter, the internet, and even mobile phones, uh, there was enormous coverage uh, from the world's media who loved nothing more than a good spy drama. But without any further <clears throat> evidence or context in which to place it, uh, the story, it may have faded away from the public consciousness within a short while, if it wasn't for a very strange occurrence that had happened two weeks previous to the Markov affair in Paris. Uh, this was an affair, it would reignite the whole episode and it would launch it into espionage folklore. <clears throat> it was an unexpectedly chilly day uh, uh, in August in the capital of France when Bulgarian journalist Vladimir Kostov made his way out of the Charles de Gaulle station on the Paris metro system. He was wearing a heavy woolen coat to keep out the cold. Kostov himself was an ex-Bulgarian spy who, like Markov, had sought asylum in the West. As he ascended the escalator, he felt a sharp pain in his back. He too saw a man running away, but no umbrella this time. Just as Markov would do later, he fell ill and he was admitted to hospital. But unlike Markov, after a couple of days, he started to feel better and within a week, he'd made a full recovery. When he learned of Markov's fate in London later, he contacted the French police who in turn contacted Scotland Yard, who then made a very strange request to their French counterparts. On the 25th of September 1978, with Kostov's consent, a small surgical operation was performed at the site of the injury to his back. And a piece of tissue, about the size of a thumbnail, was removed. It was rushed to London by couriers. And um, there, a Professor Robin Keeley, um, he first x-rayed this tissue and he found the presence of a tiny metallic object. He then removed the same or an identical metallic pellet from the site of Kostov's injury. It too was empty. So if the pellet from Kostov was empty, why had he survived and Markov hadn't? Well, police theorised that the clothing Kostov was wearing on that cold August day may have saved him, the heavy woolen coat. It, it meant that the pellet hadn't penetrated more than a couple of dermis layers of skin. Uh, unlike Markov, who had been injected and it had um, uh, penetrated deep into his leg. With Kostov, this had not been the case and um, it hadn't been deep enough to enter his bloodstream. Now, 
with Markov, it had entered into his bloodstream, um, destroying uh, vital organs, uh, causing multiple catastrophic hemorrhages, uh, and in four days, uh, heart, the heart attack which led to his uh, death. So the police then thought, well, how much could the pellets have contained? Well, they worked it out that both pellets could have contained two tenths of a milligram, <clears throat> a minuscule amount, ten times less than a lethal dose of cyanide. Only a few terrifying toxins uh, fitted the bill, if you like. One of these was plutonium, the radioactive material. Uh, two others were something called abrin and another called ricin. Well, it wasn't radioactive, <clears throat> so it could not have been plutonium. Abrin and ricin, they, they both work to destroy the body's nervous system, but in different ways. And uh, Markov's uh, symptoms, they pointed to it being uh, ricin. So to test their theory, the scientists performed um, a scientific experiment. They injected a entirely healthy uh, and entirely innocent pig with the same dose of ricin. The pig suffered exactly the same fate, uh, with the same uh, hemorrhages and changes in its body that they had observed in Markov. Hence, ricin <coughs> poisoning was um, believed to be the cause of Markov's death. Now, ricin, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just going to take a drink. Ricin is derived from the castor plant, Ricinus communis. It's a highly uh, decorative and common plant here in many of our gardens in Britain. Its beans have been used for centuries to make all sorts of medicinal and cosmetic uh, products, such as migraine relief uh, and even hemorrhoid treatment. The hull or the shell of the bean, it contains a highly um, poisonous constituent uh, uh, of ricin. And it is a purification process that it undergoes that will turn it into one of the world's top five most deadly substances. <clears throat> but who is responsible for the murder of this dissident journalist? Who was the mysterious mumbling man who apologised to Markov as he murdered him? And who could have carried out this sophisticated and highly technical operation? Well, gradually, without context or evidence, the poison pellet affair faded from the media spotlight. And a lack of firm leads meant the British police inquiry was going nowhere. The inquiry, it remained open, but without impetus or direction, for the next 10 years. It would be the tumultuous uh, upheaval in Western Europe and a fall of communism in a host of Soviet bloc countries in the late 80s and 90s that would provide British police with the opportunity to revisit the case. On the 10th of November 1988, uh, 1989, one day after the fall of the Berlin Wall, General Secretary Comrade Todor Shivkov was removed from power in Bulgaria and a, a peaceful transition to a modern democratic Bulgaria began to take place. This opened a doorway, if you like, to the West with many more new opportunities but also greater scrutiny. For Bulgaria, the Markov case was an, an extremely painful reminder of an era that they would rather forget. But with uh, pressure, 
put on them by Britain and other countries, they gradually began to unravel the mystery of Markov's demise. This is Bogdan Karyatov. In the 1990s, he was a Bulgarian state investigator. The same sort of uh, status as a magistrate uh, uh, here. Now, he was given access to the secret files from the archives of the now disbanded Bulgarian Foreign Intelligence Service. Many of the documents had been systematically destroyed by a regime determined to preserve the secrets of their worst excesses. But uh, Karyatov, he found files relating to Markov. They extended back to 1974, when Markov, who was by now living and working in Britain, uh, was constantly criticising Shivkov on the BBC. These files, they recorded meetings with the KGB in Moscow about his subversive activities and possible solutions. Karyatov found files that um, named uh, Markov as a target. He was given a code name. The code name was called Vagabond. And others' files even provided the name, the code name of the agent uh, who carried out uh, the, uh, the murder of uh, Georgi Markov. He was called Agent Piccadilly. Now this is Major General Oleg Kalugin. He became the KGB's top agent serving in the United States as the resident or a chief spy in Washington. He is the highest ranked KGB agent ever to defect to the West and currently, now at 89 years of age, he lives very successfully uh, in the US. Now he stated in interviews and in books that he's written that he was present at meetings in Moscow with the KGB and Bulgarian Foreign Intelligence Services when the head, <coughs> excuse me, the head of uh, the KGB at that time, a man called Yuri Andropov, later to become, of course, President Andropov, approved a request from Todor Shivkov to murder Georgi Markov. The KGB, they agreed to provide all the technical and logistical um, expertise and support, but the agent would have to be provided by the Bulgarians themselves. Now, the Bulgarian secret services of the 1970s were in no position to uh, carry out this sophisticated attack uh, um, on their own. They just did not have the technical or logistical capabilities. They looked towards their Soviet counterparts and the KGB uh, to provide uh, to facilitate this operation. In a very drab Moscow suburb, there still sits an abandoned building, formerly known as the Moscow Scientific Institute or Laboratory No. 12. From the 1950s to the late 1980s, it employed a number of top uh, biochemists working on Soviet uh, weapons programs. Intelligence historians uh, believe it was here that the ricin was manufactured and the method of delivery was conceived and built. The KGB have always been highly skilled in the art of assassination. Their version of Q Branch uh, made famous in the fictional James Bond films, was a sophisticated and well-funded operation dedicated to the art of killing people in ingenious ways. The umbrella that you see pictured at the bottom is a replica of the weapon used to murder Georgi Markov. They were American-made umbrellas and they were stripped down and modified to inject uh, a poisonous pellet from the tip. I can't verify this 
uh, next bit, but I read online once uh, that in the offices of the defunct Bulgarian Foreign Intelligence Service, uh, in a storeroom area, there was found a cache of 20 to 30 similar umbrellas. Most were said to have been destroyed, but perhaps an entrepreneurial soul may have spirited one or two away, I don't know, but uh, anyway, this uh, example is housed in the Washington Spy Museum. Now, one of Bogdan Karyatos' most important and most interesting finds was a file that put a name to Agent Piccadilly. Agent Piccadilly was a, uh, a Danish national of Italian descent named Francesco Gulino. He was born in May 1945. And according to a Bulgarian historian, Christo Christov, uh, Gulino was a petty thief and uh, sometimes smuggler of illicit Western goods into Bulgaria, things like jeans, cassettes, chewing gum even. He was arrested twice by Bulgarian authorities trying to smuggle goods into Bulgaria. The second time, he was given an ultimatum. Go to prison for a very long time or become an agent for the Bulgarian intelligence services. It was an offer he didn't <coughs> refuse. He didn't refuse. He was given a cover story as an art and antiques dealer with a business in Copenhagen. Now, as a Westerner with a job that would take him across Europe, he could come and go without any suspicion whatsoever. He visited London a, a lot uh, from the mid-1970s onwards. And records show that he visited London four times in 1978. And the last time he left uh, he left the United Kingdom a day after the attack on Georgi Markov, and he never returned again. He was supposedly active as a spy until 1990. And crucially, crucially really, he has received two state Bulgarian medals for services to a public order and safety. Well, as time wore on, <clears throat> Bulgarian authorities, they displayed a reluctance to rake over the coals of the past. They were anxious to join the European Union, a feat they achieved on the 1st of January 2007. And there was no political will to dig any further than they needed to. Bulgaria's legal constitution provides a 30-year statute of limitations on cases like this. It is something that they have waived in this case, but still they have no appetite to heap further embarrassment upon themselves. British jurisdiction has no statute of limitations and the case still remains open, but with no impetus or direction at this time. For their part, of course, the Russians have always denied any involvement in the, um, uh, in, the, uh, in the incidents in September 1978. In 2014, in November, the then Bulgarian president, a man called uh, Rosen Plevneliev, he unveiled a statue dedicated to Georg, Georgi Markov in Journalist Square in Sofia. Um, among those in attendance was his uh, widow, Annabel. She said it was always his wish to return to Bulgaria and he had now um, uh, returned uh, to form a, a permanent part of the landscape of Sofia. The Georgi Markov's family, they still want an apology from the Bulgarian government, which they have never had, and an acknowledgement that he was the victim of a political assassination. 
Now, when you Google <clears throat> the name of the suspect, Francesco Golino, you can bring up all sorts of information about his life, about the Markov case, and how he effectively disappeared uh, for so long afterwards. There is almost nothing to indicate whether he is alive or dead. However, on the 17th of August, uh, 2021, the Austrian newspaper, Kronen Zeitung, Crown newspaper, carried a story that almost no other media outlet in the whole world had bothered to cover. It concerned the demise of a 75-year-old man found dead in his apartment in Wessler in Austria. A friend and neighbour had uh, raised the alarm when they hadn't seen him for two or three days. In fact, he'd been dead about a week at that time. Now, according to the newspaper, the deceased was one Francesco Gulino, the notorious agent of the Bulgarian secret services. He had lived a, a quiet, a solitary life with uh, just a couple of good friends. But everyone in the district knew that he was the alleged poison umbrella assassin. If he was indeed the same person who had carried out that heinous crime 45 years earlier, I hope that in his last moments he reflected on all the pain and suffering he not only caused Georgi Markov but his family as well and he at least asked someone for forgiveness. In 2000, Georgi Markov, he was awarded posthumously the Order of the Star of Planina, the <coughs> White Star of Bulgaria. It is Bulgaria's highest honour and it is usually reserved for presidents or prime ministers. Oh, the irony that the country that was honouring him so highly had, had, had uh, plotted and murdered him. Now, international espionage is, as I said before, a dirty, murky world full of betrayal, deceit and treachery. And it is played out in plain sight in every country in the world, every day, right before us. Governments use espionage as a way of furthering their own interests and agendas. The United Kingdom is no different. Our intelligence capabilities are vast and sophisticated entities capable of delving into the most darkest recesses of all our private lives. Where I hope that we differ is that we don't, to my limited knowledge, use murder as a legitimate method of solving uh, our problems. As perhaps an obvious example of a government that does, in, Re uh, in Russia in 2006, Vladimir Putin formally incorporated into the Russian constitution a law permitting the extrajudicial murder of anybody anywhere in the world deemed to be uh, an extremist or a threat to Russia. As we have, or well, leaving aside the events in Ukraine, as we've witnessed with the Novichok poisonings, with the Litvinenko case, with the poisoning and imprisonment of Alex Navalny, the opposition leader, and with the murders of many anti-government journalists, President Putin has no respect for uh, life or international law. Well, it's always the families of the victims that, that bear the pain and suffering of these of these crimes. And uh, that's certainly true for Annabelle uh, Markov and her family. She will always remember those uh, desperately tragic events of uh, 45 years ago. But 
she's flourished throughout the years to become um, a, a very successful, award-winning uh, writer under her, maiden, her, under her maiden name of Annabel Dilk. Uh, this on screen being just a, a very uh, um, limited representation of, of all of her, of her authorship. Killing Georgi Markov ultimately counted for nothing. The Berlin Wall still fell. Communism still collapsed in a host of Soviet bloc countries. And that frosty relationship between East and West, it would uh, thaw at least for the next 20 years. Bulgaria, well, it went through an intense period of social change and political change to emerge as a modern democratic European nation. A lot of Cold War historians, they say Markov was killed purely because Todor Shivkov was a man who couldn't take criticism either personally or of his government, his regime. And that uh, killing him, it was an act of pure revenge on their part. Was it coincidence that the date of the attack on Markov was the 7th of September? Todor Shivkov's own birthday. Georgi Markov is only one <coughs> of a countless number of people who have died, have been silenced for daring to give voice to uncomfortable truths. He paid the ultimate price for defending that very precious and very fragile gift of free speech. And ladies and gentlemen, it is a gift that we must never <coughs> take for granted. Thank you very much. Wow, what a story. Are there any questions? They were stunned. I think we're all stunned, yeah, with the detail of it all, yeah. But I think uh, in that case, uh, John would like to say a word. Thank you. Thank you, John. Well, Paul, what can I really say? First of all, what a speech, what a talk. It was not only exciting, it was frightening. It was not only frightening, it was absorbing. And it was not only absorbing, but it was really informative. I felt at one stage, I was walking across that bridge and I was worried I was going to be stabbed in the back. <laughs> the next moment, I felt that I was getting to know that man, Markov. We had such a description of how he was before this event occurred. I thought today's talk was one of the best talks I've ever heard. It gave me inspiration to think that there is something in the future and that free speech is one of them which we must preserve. Thank you, Paul, for a wonderful talk. Thank and you very much. I hope that we will say <laughs> Um, as well as being a, a public speaker, uh, I'm also a, a, a tour guide. I have my own company, um, and uh, I, I run talks. I, I run tours in London. I only have one uh, tour, uh, and this is an, a, a real-life espionage-themed tour of uh, central London. We we look at. Sorry, I'm trying to put that on. That's better. Um, we look at the iconic uh, um, sites and the characters from the world of real-life international espionage, such as Alexander Litvinenko, famous World War II spies, etc., etc., uh, uh, around this St. James area. Uh, and then we take a trip uh, to, down to MI6, outside, unfortunately, 
uh, we, I regale you with stories about MI6, and then we, we come back and we finish in Grosvenor Square. Uh, without boring you any more, I have given the details to your um, walks coordinator, whose name, I'm sorry, I, I forget. Um, and uh, if there is any interest, I would love to host you at some point in the future. Um, so uh, thank you very much, and uh, I hope to see you again. Thank you.
Yeah. 